recording will stop before the meeting is opened up to the floor. And I also need to make you aware that members of the press have been invited to attend this session. So in terms of the format of the session today, each of our speakers will talk for 10 to 15 minutes before I open up the floor for discussion. And then we'll come back at the end to give the speakers time to respond and to offer any closing remarks. So before I introduce the speakers, I just want to point you to a statement that we'll be asking attendees to read and sign. So I'll drop the link in the chat in the next few minutes. And the statement basically encapsulates what we're covering at the conference today and what is the first step in building a distinct left pool in the debate around a united Ireland. And we can also use that to keep you up to date on any future meetings. So to get on with the important business then um, of this afternoon's session, uh, we have an excellent lineup of speakers to discuss what is of course a very important topic, not just historically, but also um, in today's society. So in the North, it is presumed by mainstream media and academia that the ideologies of unionism and nationalism are ever fixed and will never change. People are born into one camp or the other, and that's the way it has been and will continue to be. It is presumed that people in nationalist areas have always, been, have always remained solidly nationalist, never veering away from it. It is presumed that people in what's described as unionist communities have always all, automatically on every occasion followed the lead of the leading unionist party of the day. And whilst of course many have, it's far from the full picture of what happens or takes place in working class communities. There is a rich tradition from the United Irishmen through to the 19th, 20th and 21st century of Protestants being not only active in, but central to radical campaigns for change in the North and across the island. So there is a rich history of campaigns and activists fighting to end the imposition of the border and two right-wing administrations across the island that followed it. So today we'll be discussing some of those historical but also modern examples of how ordinary people fought back. If anybody has read the excellent coverage of the recent riots by Susan McKay, they will get a fresh and honest account of how people in working class Protestant communities feel left behind, left out and failed by the actions of the DUP, paramilitaries and other forces claiming to stand up and represent them. So today we will discover those radical traditions, the rich and radical history that is purposefully ignored and written out of the narrative. So to introduce today's speakers then, um, we are still waiting for Des Bell to join us and we hope that he will join us in the next, um, in the next while. Um, so we also have um, Susan McKay, who is a well-known journalist, a commentator and author of the excellent Northern Protestants, a seminal work in the North. And she has also authored Northern Protestants on Shifting Ground, which I think is released next month. Um, I'll introduce Des, I'll give the little introduction to Des in the hope that he will be able to join us. So Desmond Bell is Professor and Head of Academic Affairs at the National College of Art and Design, where he runs the PhD programme and is Director of Research. Prior to that, he was Professor of Film and Visual Arts at Queen's University, Belfast. He is an active filmmaker and has produced a range of acclaimed creative documentary films for television and the cinema, which have been played at a number of international film festivals, including Venice, Montreal, Dublin and Denver. His last film, The Enigma of Frank Ryan, dealt with the story of radical Republican Frank Ryan, who led the Irish contingent of the international brigades in the Spanish Civil War, and who later ended up in Berlin collaborating with the Nazis. He has published extensively on film topics. So uh, we also have, of course, um, Sean Mitchell, who is author of A Rebel's Guide to James Connolly and Struggle or Starve, a gripping account of the outdoor relief riots in Belfast, in Belfast where Catholics and Protestants organized together against the meager unemployment measures that the Stormont government offered at that time. So our first speaker, I think, is going to be Sean. So if I can invite you to take the floor, Sean. Okay, thanks very much. I mean, uh, speaking of his time in Belfast, 
James Connolly once remarked that it sometimes felt like promoting 20th century revolutionism amidst the mental atmosphere of the early 17th century. And I suppose given the scenes we've witnessed in the last few weeks, we could forgive anyone for feeling like this archaic mental atmosphere has survived well into the 21st century. But I think it's important to grasp the flip side of that coin, not only what remains the same, but also the great changes that have taken place in the North in recent decades, not least in the growing number of people who are questioning basic sectarian propositions, yearn for an end to segregation and schooling and housing, and the possibility, therefore, of winning people on both sides of the divide, and those who have no allegiance to either, to a vision of an Ireland greater than the miserable and endemically corrupt government we have perched on the hill at Stormont. If we're to create the kind of just and equitable society that we strive for, that looks beyond the suffocating atmosphere of, of sectarianism, then it strikes me that it is urgently necessary to rediscover and reconfigure something approaching what we are here to talk about today, which is the radical Protestant tradition. In attempting to offer a basic sketch of this often overlooked aspect of our history, I want to first of all dispense with two unhelpful frameworks that dominate much of the political discussion here. The first is a simplistic uh, approach common to many Irish nationalists and Republicans the cast the Protestant community, both past and present, as a singular monolithic reactionary bloc, denying the many shades of opinion that it has produced and the class divides within it, but also ignoring the role of many Protestants in the creation of radical politics in this island, failing to recognize, in other words, the Protestants too, particularly poor and working class Protestants, have a stake in challenging the corruption and inequality of the two states in this island. Not only is this approach historically inaccurate, but it's also, in my opinion, counterintuitive, reinforcing for many Protestants, or many people from a Protestant background, that they have no stake in a new Ireland. The second approach that I want to avoid today is one that's common to many sections of the academy here, that accepts the existence of some form of radical Protestantism, but strains to locate it within sections of loyalism, or to shoehorn it into some fixed and immutable Unionist or Ulster Scots identity. I mean, anyone expecting a lead from the much vaunted forces of progressive loyalism in the last decade or so can't be anything but mortally disappointed as welfare reform was imposed, as the DUP propped up a Tory government responsible for vicious austerity, as women's rights and LGBT rights were being obstructed, the organised forces of so-called progressive loyalism, with some small individual exceptions, were not only conspicuously silent, but have continued to marshal working class areas to the beat of the DUP's drum. And whilst the dynamics between loyalism and unionism and the class dimensions of this are complex, that festering sense of grievance, which is at the centre of the loyalist mentality, as Tom Pollan put it, and whilst acknowledging that there are, of course, many people who hold progressive positions alongside allusions in the union, what I want to instead focus on today is the less obvious threat of radicalism within the Protestant community that rarely gets a hearing. Those who have sought to go beyond the confines of unionism and orangeism into a more radical framework, into socialist politics, anti-imperialism, class politics, anti-racism, various forms of women's liberation and so on. Of course, in covering this, and I can only give a mere sketch, we have to understand that it's a diverse and many faceted history, sometimes messy and contradictory, but one that holds far more richness and possibility than the static notions of identity heavily promoted by the Northern state uh, would have us uh, presume. And I hope to give a, a small flavor of, of that in my limited time today and um, uh, and apologies in advance to the chair for going over my allocated time. Any effort to deny the existence of a current of Protestant radicalism here has to skip over the elementary fact the Protestant, the radical politics on this island can be traced back to the actions of Protestants themselves. I mean, it's no great historical revelation, but it nevertheless sits awkwardly with the common presumptions of many nationalists. The traditions of anti-imperialism in this country, the unity of Catholic Protestant dissent, in other words, can be traced back to the radical Protestants themselves. People like Samuel McTeer, William Sinclair, Thomas McCabe, Samuel Nielsen, all Belfast Presbyterians, who drafted the plan for the United Irishmen, calling for a cordial union among all the people of Ireland for the purposes of securing an equal representation for all the people of Ireland. And perhaps most famously of all of Protestants like Henry Joy McCracken and Wolf Tone, who inspired by the international events, what Tone called the, the morning star of liberty in, in the French and American revolutions and deeply influenced by Thomas Paine's rights of man, sought to build an Ireland free from the stranglehold of both colonialism and clerical sectarianism. And it's worth recalling um, that you know, at least 30 Presbyterians, to Presbyterian ministers were accused of involvement in the 1798 rebellion. Six of the Presbyterian leaders, including Henry Joy McCracken himself, were, were hanged for their participation. Wolf Tone called sectarianism the ghastly specter of our distempered imagination and wanted to build an Ireland free from either church control or what would become known as the Protestant descendancy. Indeed, he stated we should not content ourselves with pulling down the establishment without setting up any other, that we should have no state religion, 
a secular sentiment that later Catholic nationalists would come to portray, despite claiming to stand in its tradition, particularly in the creation of a southern 26 county state, deeply entwined with the power of the Catholic Church. Tone's edict that corruption is the only medium of government in Ireland might strike us today as depressingly familiar when we survey what we call government in this stateland in present times. By contrast, the United Irishmen look to the multitude of human beings, the living mass of humanity associated to exist. In them, they found the original source of social authority, the measure of political value, and the pedestal of legitimate power. Under the pressure of international events, the 1790s occasioned the, the birth of radical politics on this island, but it also coincided with the birth of Orangism, with the order being formed with the specific intent of re-establishing sectarian and colonial supremacy in Ireland. I have arranged to increase the animosity between the Orange men and the United Irishmen, the commander from Mid Ulster assured his superiors at the time. Upon that animosity, he said, depends the safety of the centre counties, counties of, of the North. Thus, Orangeism was, was born not only out of a Protestant identity, but out of an orchestrated effort to snuff out the radical anti-sectarian traditions within the Protestant community itself. As one supporter of the British establishment put it, upon principle, I am the enemy of all kinds of religious party, but the enemies of our establishment have reduced us to make a divide a justifiable measure. The United Irishmen had concretely posed the question of how an anti-sectarian Ireland might be formed, but they also faced the question of how to do so against efforts by elites to divide people along communal lines. The movement had rested on an uneasy alliance between wealthy merchants and masses of toiling people. Tone had, all, had stated that I always find the subalterns greater men than the principals, and that if the men of, no pro of property will not help us, they must fall. But in efforts to hold his all-class alliance together, he'd propose a compromise that would restrict suffrage to the sound and respectable part of the Catholic community. After the defeat of the raising and under pressure of Orange reaction, many of these more respectable elements would desert the cause. As James Connolly noted, by the time of the Emmett conspiracy in 1803, the majority of middle-class members of the society had absconded with the Republican movement settling in over an extended period of time over the next century into more of the Catholic movement that it became, which invariably held less appeal to Northern Protestants. The chief lesson of this was summed up by Henry Joy McCracken when he said that the rich always betray the poor, but if not these respectable elements of society, then who could take up the cudgels for the rad radical tradition of Catholic Protestant dissenter? The Presbyterian Jemmy Hope and uh, uh, a United Irishman and a poor weaver living in Belfast in very humble circumstances, one reported, put it, suggested a route that might have weakened the capacity of Orangism. None of our leaders, he said, seemed to me perfectly acquainted with the main cause of social derangement. It was my settled opinion that the condition of the labouring class was the fundamental issue between the rulers and the people, and there could be no solid foundation for liberty till measures were adopted that went to the root of the evil. Jemmy Hope's more class-based, even socialistic politics would eventually get a hearing as Belfast working class began to grow throughout the 19th century. But as with the United Irishmen themselves, this would also have to coincide with persistent efforts to disrupt it through the menace of sectarianism. Before considering that, it's worth noting that what you may call the tradition of liberal Protestant radicalism, the United Irishmen did not simply vanquish with its defeat. It lived on in the activities of Protestants like Marianne McCracken, the sister of Henry Joy, who campaigned for education against child labor and for better conditions of the workhouses throughout her life. And importantly, was a key figure in the campaign against the slave trade. McCracken's spirit lived on in the likes of Alice Milligan, the Protestant convert to Irish independence, who, won who wrote one of the earliest biographies of Tone at the turn of the century, and whose newspaper was an early platform for James Connolly's ideas. We see it in a less direct way, but in no less important than the many Protestant women who were early pioneers of women's suffrage, with the Irish suffragettes, uh, leadership predominantly drawn from the Protestant community, mainly Quakers, but Presbyterians, Methodists, and many women from the Church of Ireland were central too. But the liberal tradition, resting as it did in the middle classes, would, would gradually crumble in the face of unionist resistance. And as James Connolly, like Jamie Hope argued, the only incorruptible inheritors of the radical tradition came to be found in the North burgeoning labour movement. But like the United Irishmen, this nascent socialism benefited from both the Protestant radicalism and the efforts of unionist forces to extinguish it. Consider the case of Alexander Bowman, for example, who was arguably the first working class candidate in Ireland and one of the first either here or Britain who ran for North Belfast MP in 1885. Ironically, Bowman's challenger was the Tory William Ewart, who was also his former employer. And despite the fact that Bowman was raised a Presbyterian, he was slandered by his opponent as anti-Protestant because of his support for a very moderate liberal proposal for home rule. And this became a, a common method by Tories and elite unionists for attacking Belfast's growing labor movement. Indeed, in 1893, when the British TUC first held its conference in Belfast, the march organized afterwards, led by British laborers like Keir Hardy, was attacked by loyalists. That's not to say that things like the Orange Order were monolithic. 
when Michael Davitt was setting up the land leaks, he initially addressed Orange Lodges and got some support. When Jim Larkin was organizing in Belfast, he got support from a breakaway independent Orange Order. But the issue was simple. Any movement that was predicated on the need for class unity and opposition to the power of the establishment was always going to have to come up against an ideology whose raise on detriment was to maintain division and the power of the establishment in the first place. In the face of this persistent Orange reaction, some drew the conclusion that it was necessary to moderate the line in order to win votes from working class people. This was given its most odious expression by the right-wing laborist William Walker, who effectively gave his approval to anti-Catholic bigotry as a means to win votes. But others, most notably James Connolly, drew a different conclusion. Not only was it wrong to moderate one's views, as the struggle against capitalism could not be separated from the struggle against sectarianism, but they went further, arguing that it was necessary to advocate for a more radical vision of Ireland that offered up than those offered up by Irish nationalists or liberals. In the language of the time, this necessitated demanding not only home rule, but worker, a workers' republic that could actually offer something to all the toiling masses of Ireland, including those from a Protestant background. Otherwise, as Connolly put it, you were asking Protestants to abandon the British devil they knew for the Irish nationalist devil they did not. Connolly never lived to see the heights of the Irish Revolution, but it is striking how even without a serious organization behind it, the vision of a workers' republic, this radical social vision that he had, was able to win sections of Protestant working class people behind it. The hundreds of Protestants who were won to the radical alliance of socialist, communist, and left Republicans in the Republican Congress during the Great Depression, for example, with hundreds marching at 1934 with tone commemoration behind a banner that read, break the connection with camp capitalism, Shankill Road Branch, before the possibility was squandered as the movement retreated from a workers' republic to the politics of nationalism. There were many radical Protestants in this period, one to this kind of vision, people like George Gilmore, or Captain Jack White, who was brought up in an Anglican family and fought for the British Army in the Boer War, but later converted to socialism, helping James Connolly to form the Irish Citizen Army, later joining communists in Belfast in 1931 to defend unemployed marches against attacks by loyalists before serving in the Republican side in the Spanish Civil War. It's also what attracted radical anti-partition Protestants like Betty Sinclair, um, who was from a Church of Ireland background, or Billy McCulloch, whose father was a Protestant Orangeman uh, uh, and was drawn to the ideal of a workers' republic during the Catholic and Protestant unity of 1932. The ODR rats had a radicalizing effect on many Protestants who went to fight in the Republican side in Spanish Civil War. People like Liam Tummelson, who was a youngster, as a youngster was in the Orange Order, but later became an anti-partition socialist and died fight fighting the fascists in Spain, with his comrades eulogizing him by declaring the only fitting way to remember him was by fighting for a workers' republic. It's not just individuals, it's also evidence, and we, we can forget this looking back on uh, in the aftermath of the way things fell out, but it's evidence that the, the, the ideal of the workers' republic had an appeal within sections of the Protestant working class beyond the ranks of the organized left. In the 1920 local elections, Labour won 12 out of 60 seats with Sam Kyle, who was born into a Protestant family in Belfast, and at the time was an open advocate for the need for a workers' republic, top, top the poll on the shankle. This was something that was survived post-partition for a period too. Jack Beatty, who was born into a Presbyterian family in East Belfast, topped the poll in East Belfast in 1925, despite his promotion of a workers' republic and organized efforts by loyalists to disrupt meetings uh, uh, at the time. The pressure of electoralism would gradually force many of these more moderate um, uh, laborists to, 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 to moderate their position in the national question, or in the case of Beatty, to accommodate with nationalism itself, but a nevertheless testament to the lingering capability of a radical socialist vision of Ireland to gain some foothold, at least amongst a section of working class Protestants. But this also suggested that the electoral arena, or at least the electoral arena isolation, was not sufficient for rousing the masses out of their sectarian ghettos. And the reality is that only in the context of radical socialist anti-sectarian politics has taken hold in this state is in the context of mass collective struggle. The high points are well known. The great 1907 Docker strike already mentioned the United Catholic and Protestant under Jim Larkin's divine gospel of discontent. Incidentally, the best book on that strike remained John, John Gray's book, himself a radical socialist from Protestant background, currently busy organizing a series of lectures as to why there should be nothing to celebrate in partition. The general strike in Belfast in 1919 is another example made up of the predominantly Protestant workforce led by Char the Catholic Charles Mackay that offered a glimpse of something approaching the revolutionary socialist mood uh, gripping Europe at the time and offered, ushered in the, the small but important growth of anti-partition labour politics I've mentioned already. The aforementioned outdoor relief rats in 1932 when a small group of radical socialists fought efforts by unionist government to keep people divided during the hungry 30s. 
accumulating in perhaps the only time in Irish history when Protestant and Catholic working class people built barricades on the interfaces together to keep the RUC out rather than to keep each other out, and which was undoubtedly the precipitating factor in the radicalism amongst sections of Protestant workers in the 30s. And perhaps most interestingly of all, the enormous and intense industrial arrest in Belfast during World War II, Despite the fact Protestants are often painted as being unshakably wedded to notions of loyalty to British militarism, it was Belfast, of all cities, that saw the largest industrial unrest during World War II, including a massive strike wave in 1942 after the sacking of two workers at Shorts, and later a mass strike of engineering workers in 1944, which turned into an effective general strike to demand the release of four shop stewards who'd been jailed for organizing illegal strike activity. Extraordinarily, these actions came in the face uh, of intense efforts by unionists to paint the strikers as disloyalists who were threatening the war effort, suggesting a much greater malleability in what we call Protestant identity than is sometimes presumed. In emphasizing these mass periods of working class unity and the examples they gave of the potential for radicalism in both Protestant and Catholic communities, we can't ignore the fact that like the United Irishmen, they were defeated by the orchestrated resurgence of sectarianism. The 1907 Docker strike split the Orange Order, but the persistence of Orangeism inside the working class was put to use in breaking the labor movement. As Sam Kyle put it, the 1919 general strike gave the biggest scare to the Tories they've ever had, but it was for that reason that they then whipped up the communal tensions that accumulated in the 1920 pogrom, where thousands of Catholics were expelled from their job. As I've always stri already stressed, however, Orangeism was not only an anti-Catholic creed, but a way of eradicating Protestant radicalism itself, something that was glaring in 1920, when scores of Protestant radicals and socialists were expelled from their jobs by, uh, by, by loyalists alongside the Catholics. It was the same story with the outdoor relief rats. And we see it today too, in the way that the Orange Order celebrations are not only used to unite people against United Ireland, but also to warn people from their platform about the supposed dangers of multiculturalism or LGBT rights, done something that many Protestants and Catholics, of course, are supporting in increasing numbers. So to draw my remarks to, clues, to, to conclusion, I think it's imperative on us to, to rediscover the thread of this radical Protestant tradition as messy and as contradictory and as many faceted as it is. I mean, it lives on in many different ways. And, you know, the mass abortion rights movement that we've seen here in the last few years lives on in thousands of young people who came out for Black Lives Matter and the inspiring climate uh, strike. The problem is that the politics, the media, academy, all the various funding streams offer them no means of identification beyond the confines of of, of nationalism or unionism. I mean, you can be a radical, sure, but only a radical unionist or a radical nationalist. So in seeking to develop that new third current, if you will, that tradition to rediscover something in a modern context of that tradition of Catholic, Protestant, migrant and dissenter, there are four key takeaways, I think. Firstly, it is only in the context, I think in reality, of a radical social vision, um, as with the United Irishmen or Connolly's Workers' Republic, that large sections of Catholics and Protestants have been won to a vision of transformative change here. And building a new Ireland, therefore, we have to discard any semblance of nationalism and fight for an Ireland can offer people something tangible on both sides of the divide here. Secondly, it's important the importance of international events cannot be uh, underestimated. There's a tendency sometimes to see politics here as painfully exceptional. Sometimes it can be. But the reality is, is that all the great progressive movements in this island coincide with global movements. 1798 with the French Revolution. 1907 can't be understood except in the aftermath of things like the 1905 Russian Revolution. Same with the 1919 general strike. The outdoor relief rats are very much part of the, the movements of the Great Depression and so on. And I think today, movements like Climate Strike or Black Lives Matter can play an equally electrifying role here, lifting people's sights beyond the pessimism that local politics can induce. Thirdly, the centrality of mass politics. I mean, mass struggle is clarifying, but it's also cleansing in many ways to break people from their ideas, the muck of ages, as Marx won't put it. And the radical left, in my opinion at least, has to be bold enough to move beyond what Peter Sherlow provocatively, but quite accurately in my opinion, called bourgeois notions of community relations and to build movements that can offer real hope to people and to speak to their everyday concerns rather than just offering up vague platitudes about the need to learn from each other's culture. Lastly, building any kind of left here, of course, will be messy, but one thing is for certain, if left unchecked, the politics of sectarianism always breaks the movement. Uh, and if we're really to build a future free from sectarianism, then we have to move beyond, I think, the, the state structures that we have here today that, that, um, that, that ensure them. Um, uh, and that means, I think, fighting for a new radical vision uh, of an island for all that everyone can have a stake in. Thanks very much. Thanks so much for that, Sean. Uh, absolutely fascinating. Um, so much to take in. 
Sean covers uh, in about in 15 minutes what I think it would take anybody else an hour to cover. So uh, such a great speaker. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, so I'm delighted to say that uh, Des has been able to join us. So Des, if you would like to take to the floor. Oh, I think you're on mute there, Des. Hear me now? Yes, absolutely. Crack on there, Des. Um, I was asked to speak on the radical Protestant tradition. I have to say from the outset, I have a certain uneasiness, uh, and this often arises, I think, when we as radicals approach this topic. Um, after all, uh, is consideration of religious background really relevant when we talk about radical political traditions in Ireland, particularly socialist ones? Socialists, of course, pride themselves in prioritizing, universalizing class identities and struggles over religious and ethnic ones. Indeed, as internationalists, we shudder at the petty narcissisms uh, of national difference. But on the other hand, we do acknowledge that in societies that have been subject to colonization, complex and difficult relations often exist between ethnic and class differences. And of course, lurking beneath this topic is its dark side, namely the question, what is to be done about Ulster unionism? After all, this is the ideology and set of political practices which is fundamentally shaped the political sensibilities of Northern Protestants since the last decades of the 19th century. Indeed, in a gathering like this, um, and I very much appreciate the work of all the organizers in getting this conference together, but in a gathering like this, abounding with a certain degree of optimism about United Ireland, we have to keep reminding ourselves that there are quite a lot of people still wielding considerable power, indeed with powerful friends who are likely to spoil the party. Indeed, just as the mass mobilization of loyalists in an all-class alliance played a key role in securing partition as the least worst option for unionists, and of course the best for British imperialism, so the post-Brexit machinations of contemporary unionism and its continuing capacity to garner widespread support within the Protestant population represent one of the most, one of the major obstacles of a peaceful transition to an agreed reunited Ireland. And of course, 2021 marks the centenary of Northern Ireland, that warped political entity created on the basis of sectarian headcount as a result of the partition of Ireland. Not everyone, of course, has been celebrating up here. Some have marked the event by rediscovering a new old traditions of riot, disorder, and sectarian bile. But generally speaking, the celebrations have been very mooted. Nationalists have been reluctant to acknowledge the anniversary at all, um, and unionists, even for their part, appear embarrassed about the whole matter. Um, perhaps COVID and Brexit are wrong with pressing concerns. From the outset, it's probably important to draw a philosophical distinction, distinction between Protestants and unionists. There's a tendency in political discourse on Northern Ireland to conflate these terms. And what we usually have is a self-validating circularity, which fails to acknowledge the fundamentally sectarian character of the political structures within which citizens get to vote in this place. The responsibility of historical materialists, I would argue, is to prize open the terms Protestant and unionist. With the decline in the hegemonic position of unionism over the last 50 years, there's some evidence of electoral realignment in Northern Ireland, a growth in the number of Protestants of a liberal disposition, uh, perhaps in continuity, you know, Sean has said, with various movements in the past, no longer willing to support the unionist bloc. The recent campaigns on LGBT rights, on abortion, which have arrested, of course, in earlier campaigns for gender equality mounted by the women's movement, may prove to be the crucial factor in this development. Unfortunately, the tendency to conflate politics and ethno-religious identity present in all the guff we have surrounding the Good Friday Agreement and the idea of two traditions um, fails to acknowledge that the Good Friday Agreement in many ways as a political settlement has actually reproduced sectarian relations and the categorization of life along that axis, both at the level of discourse and institutional practice. Politics within Northern Ireland's devolved government seemed reduced to horse trading between the DUP and Sinn Féin, each purporting to represent distinct blocs, unionist and nationalist. In that sense, the Good Friday Agreement is the heir to the bitter legacy of partition and not a solution to it. 
However, one of the ways that we can perhaps give substance to that important philosophical distinction uh, between Protestants and Unionists um, is reminding ourselves of various radical traditions historically within the broader Protestant experience. And I don't want to repeat myself or repeat what Sean did in his very, very uh, co comprehensive treatment. So I'll try and uh, uh, reduce some of this. First, I want to just give a, a note of caution when we start talking about radical Protestant tradition. Particularly as exemplified in the paradigmatic case of the United Irishmen and the 1798 Rising. This is, of course, now become really part of the Republican imaginary, which I mean that if the revolutionaries of 1798 did not exist, they would have to be invented. Tone, McCracken, Russell appear within the Republican imagination as a pantheon resurrected on ceremonial occasions to reassure contemporary Sinn Féin, a party with a less than impressive record in recruiting members from a Protestant cultural background, that Republicanism is a non-sectarian creed with Protestant antecedents. This imaginary parallels a new geniality toward unionists often found in well-intentioned folk south of the border. Someone will often tell you, ah, sure, in the end, the unionists in the north, they're basically like us because we share a common island. After all, we're all Irish men and women. In this sort of one nation view of Ulster Protestants shared by Republican ideologues and the plain people of Ireland alike, unionists will eventually wise up or perhaps even rise up um, and see that their long-term interests lie in abandoning the injurious link with perfidious Albion. They've been betrayed before and they will be again by Britain, not least the recent betrayals that the UP has experienced. In time, they'll throw the lot in with the Republic, which with a few judicious tweaks in the constitutional structures of governance, should be able to accommodate them in the shiny, bright new, globally facing Ireland. This hail fellow well met approach when adopted by the bourgeois nationalist politicians in the South seems to very quickly degenerate into a plea that we must try to understand unionists better. This rhetoric began quite a long time ago in the mid 1980s at the time of the Forum for New Ireland, later in the Anglo-Irish Agreement, and of course is central to the Good Friday Agreement. It's a rather less generous position than is often assumed. Indeed, the imperative to respect and understand unionists and their British identity increasingly functions as an excuse for doing nothing at all to advance the project of unification. Even as the shaky edifice of Northern Ireland creaks, frays and slowly begins to crumble, Southern politicians delay and dissemble. Sure, you wouldn't want to disturb the horses, would you? Let's revisit the Protestant practical, uh, radical tradition. Can we talk about one tradition? Can this be seen as stretching from the dissenting republicanism of the late 18th century through the appearance of insurrectional nationalism, the time of the famine, through to the tenant and land agitation, revolutionary republicanism of the early 20th century, the rise of the labor movement and the socialist politics? Can we talk of a common tradition or is this really a series of overlapping on occasions contesting traditions? Indeed, when we talk about a Protestant tradition of radicalism, are we making some vague claim about the influence of a tradition of dissent and conscience rooted in a religious practice, or simply noting that Protestants, alongside uh, those of a Catholic religious background, or indeed of no religion at all, have played not an insignificant role in forging a common tradition of political radicalism. Now, I don't want to go over all this again, but clearly uh, the, the paradigmatic case you know, for Protestant radicalism is the, is the Society of the United Irishmen. This can be seen partly as the continuity of a tradition of Protestant or Creole nationalism seen in the volunteer movement of the 1780s. The Patriots chafed at English interference in Irish parliamentary sovereignty and trade. The volunteer movement, movement, which a number of the United Irishmen participated in, had an aristocratic leadership and a largely bourgeois membership and a split on the issue of Catholic emancipation. A more distinctive, assertive nationalism emerged with the founding of the United Irishmen. The Northern largely covenanting elements also contain radicals inspired not only by the abstract idea of the French Revolution, but by the appearance of class fissures in the Jacobin Revolution and its egalitarian ideals. These materialized in France in the proto-socialist movement, Society of Equals, which Marx was to identify as perhaps the first appearance of a communist movement. 
Marx and Engels might also have focused on a movement like the United Irishmen, which also saw the first appearance of forms of class consciousness and radical egalitarianism in figures like Jimmy Hope, the Shan that Sean's already talked about. A covenanter who played an active part in the early trade union movement in Ulster, and he sought to make labor and the grain question central to the political demands um, of the United Irishmen, alongside the struggle for Catholic emancipation, of course, and political independence. Hope identified the emerging class divisions in Irish society, three parties, he says, those whose industry produced the necessaries of life those who circulated them, I guess he means the merchant class, and those whose subsistence depended on fictitious claims and capital and lived and acted as if men and cattle were created solely for the use and benefit. And he wasn't just a theorist. Hope traveled to Dublin in 1796 to organize the workers in uh, the capital and to seek to recruit artisans to the United Irishmen. He himself worked as a cotton weaver. He recruited the textile workers in Balbriggan, then in the Liberties in Dublin, building a union with considerable support amongst the Protestant artisans of that district. When the rising came in 1798, uh, and it was, became clear that the city's reinforced garrison would crush the United Irish insurrection in Dublin, many of these workers, these Protestant workers, joined the largely Catholic rebels in the countryside where the real rebellion took place. A younger generation of activists of, activists of Northern origins and, and Covenanter, Covenanter stock like John Mitchell joined the Young Ireland movement alongside Protestant gentry like William Smith O'Brien in the wake of the Irish famine. In the journal he edited, this is O'Brien, this is Mitchell, the United Irishman, Mitchell directly appealed to the traditions of radical Protestant separatism first seen in 1798, emblazoning Wolf Tone's message on the journal's front page. Our, our independence, Tone had said, must be at all hazards. If the men of property will not support us, they must fall. We can support ourselves by the aid of that most numerous and respectable class of the community, the men of no property. <clears throat> Under the spell of a nationalism which was separatist in strategy, but limited in its social program, somebody like Mitchell found it harder to deal with class issues and democratic struggles than some of his covenantic predecessors like Jimmy Hope. As is widely known, Mitchell once banished to America after his uh, period in Australia, became a defender of slavery and of the Confederacy, and apparently unable to see the parallels between the fate of the Negro slave and that of the Catholic courtier, as others had. This blindness came back to haunt republicanism um, and forces us to exercise some caution when we plot a common republican tradition. In 2018, in the context of the Black Lives Matter movement, some 1,200 signatures from Newry residents appeared on a petition calling for the statue of Mitchell in the town to be removed. And indeed, the John Mitchell Place, where it stands, uh, to, to be renamed. Nationalists and the council were somewhat reluctant to move on this issue and became reliant on the support of unionist members to head off demands to remove the statue and to rename the street. Unionist scores feared that a dangerous precedent might uh, find people wanting to change the names of all streets. Maybe other Protestant radicals of the period are more worthy uh, of remembrance, such as my namesake, David Bell, who lived between 1818 and 1890, a tenant right activist and Republican, who trained as a dissenting minister like Mitchell. He was radicalized by his experience of the Irish famine and he helped to establish the Tenant League in Ulster, which was strong amongst his fellow religionists. Despairing of constitutional methods, he joined the semi-secret Irish Republican Brotherhood, inducted into it by Jeremiah O'Donnell and Rossa, and serving on his executive. Exiled in the US from 1865, he sought to associate Fenianism with the agenda of black suffrage and post-bellum reconstruction. Numerous other radicals of Protestant heritage were, of course, to place key parts in the separatist movements and in the labor movements and play a key role in the revolutionary events of the first decades of the 20th century. However, the role of radicals really has been constrained considerably, whether they're Protestant or Catholic origins, by the events in the 20th century. The main story here is the consolidation of unionism in Ulster on the basis of a cross-class alliance. This marginalized Protestant nationalists, liberals and socialists in the context of the sectarian mobilizations against home rule in the last decades of the 19th century and the first of the 20th. 
The growth in the religiously and politically conservative and evangelical Protestantism from the 1850s also seriously weakened the radical dissenting tradition. In 1921, the creation of the Northern Ireland state further consolidated Unionist hegemony and unleashed a series of vicious sectarian campaigns that Sean has talked about. From now on, Protestant radicalism would be a much harder sell than the borders of the new sectarian statehood. The defeat of the revolutionary movement in the South and installation of a conservative Catholic state in Dublin also diminished the power of secular and radical forces throughout the island. The carnal reaction was by now in full swing. Yet, uh, again, as Sean has summarized it, the labor movement uh, in particular it was successful around particular campaigns, the welfare struggles in 1930s Belfast, the trade union struggles for pay and better working conditions during the war, the struggle for a socialist program within republicanism, crystallized around the formation of Republican Congress, the Irish participation in the defense of the Spanish Republic through the international brigades, the faltering radicalism of a mainstream trade unionism, and the Northern Ireland Labour Party, but this, this did build a bridge to the civil rights movement of the 1960s in which Protestants could once again participate. Let me conclude. The position of Ulster Unionists remains one of the major obstacles to the achievement of the reunification of Ireland. Our entreaties to unionism largely based on offering them a neoliberal economic prospectus for New Ireland enough. There is scant evidence that unionist political loyalties are predominantly governed by economic considerations. While this make us, while this may make us very, uh, them hard for us to comprehend, and who does comprehend the mysteries of unionism, the challenge is not to seek to understand the misunderstood, but to defeat a regressive reactionary creed. Sometimes I, I hold myself responsible for some of this concern with understanding loyalism. I conducted quite a lot of sociological work and made films, which were very often uh, championed within the South of Ireland precisely because they appeared to provide some mode of understanding of a political position, a political ideology, which most people find incomprehensible south of the border. The danger with that is that in, mis in mistakes, what the problem is, the problem is not to understand unionism, it is to defeat it and defeat it not in a politically a political sense, not, not in a military sense, but in a political sense as an ideology. One of the ways that this might be done, of course, is by prizing a part of the terms unionist and Protestant and revealing some of the radical traditions of the latter. For the left, this has to be done in a non-sentimental and hard-handed manner, ideally in the context of campaigns around rights and against austerity, struggles which can bring workers together across the sectarian divide. This, I would suggest, rather than simply providing a pantheon for radical figures from a distant past for the comfort of contemporary republicanism, has to be the priority for, inverted commas, Protestant radicals. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Des. Absolutely fascinating account. And again, very comprehensive in such a, a tight time frame. Uh, I wish we had uh, much longer than we have, unfortunately, but um, so it's already actually stimulating some interesting discussion um, and comments in the chat. So guys, please feel free to leave your, your comments um, or any questions you may have there. Um, so our final speaker then is Susan McKay. Susan, if I can ask you to take to the floor. Oh, Susan, if you just want to come off mute there. Okay. Um, thanks very much to uh, Shan and Des uh, for really brilliant, interesting, fascinating talks. Um, mine, I think, is going to be quite different because I'm focusing very much on the present and the radical traditions of the present moment. And uh, I'm going to start off talking about uh, Lyra McGee. Uh, because I think it's timely to do so. It's the second anniversary of, of her murder has just passed. Uh, she was murdered, of course, by people who would call themselves uh, Republicans uh, two years ago in Derry, my city, and a city that has not recovered from the, the horrors of her having been killed there. And when Lear was uh, killed, I immediately was asked to, to write about her because people knew that I was friendly with her, a friend of hers. 
And the first phrase that came to mind for me about Lyra was that Lyra didn't die for Irish freedom. Lyra was Irish freedom. And that has kind of stayed with me. And I found as well that it was something that kept coming up in interviews that I've recently been doing with people from a Protestant background. Um, I'd been friendly with Lyra, Lyra for quite some time when something that she wrote um, indicated to me that her background was probably Catholic. And I realized that up until that moment, um, while I had vaguely supposed that she was a Protestant, I hadn't really given it very much thought at all. And this actually delighted me. Um, maybe, probably most of the people who are, are here this afternoon are, are from Northern Ireland or have a, a strong background in Northern Ireland, but uh, it's quite hard, I think, for people who aren't from here to understand um, that old reflex that, uh, that we all used to have of scrambling to categorize everybody uh, when we encountered them along sectarian lines. Sometimes their name made it obvious, which was helpful in its way, uh, sometimes not. And there were those who were, there were those who believed all kinds of really ridiculous things like that you could tell by the set of the eyes. And the poet Scott McKendry. Uh, told me one time that his father, who was a shipyard worker, had a colleague who advised him that you could tell by looking at the back of a person's neck. Um, of course, some people would just brazenly ask, uh, you know, what foot, foot do you kick with or whatever, or are you a Protestant, are you a Catholic? Others would ask leading questions about where you lived and what school you went to, leaving the unspoken question dangle. Sometimes you just privately listened out for cues, for clues, and you didn't have to care one way or the other, you just did it. So it really thrilled me to learn that I was losing the habit. Of course, Lyra was a unique person who was wonderfully, explicitly, neither, both and other. And her murder shocked and horrified people of all backgrounds and beliefs, and even briefly brought the politicians and the churches together. She was killed on the eve of the 21st anniversary of the signing of the Good Friday Agreement when we were meant to be at peace. The gathering at her funeral was like a vision of the community united by respect that the Good Friday Agreement was meant to herald and nurture. In the middle of all the pain and anger, there was something healing in that sense of solidarity. People had been imagining, campaigning and longing for this place, call it Northern Ireland, the North or the Six Counties to change. And I was very struck uh, in one of the interviews that I did for my new book recently with uh, Sarah Laverty, who's a students union um, worker and activist on uh, climate justice and uh, reproductive rights and a range of other radical causes. And Sarah referred to Lyra as one of our own. So I'm very much coming from that background, the notion that while I am from a Protestant background, I don't very strongly identify as a Protestant, but I probably would see myself in some ways as uh, a Protestant radical at the same time. But part of my radicalism is not is in not being particularly strongly um, identified with the religion to which I was born. In my first uh, book about Northern Protestants, Northern Protestants and Unsettled People, I use the term, uh, the people I uneasily call my own. And uh, I think that has changed a bit uh, because of people like Lyra, but it remain, it does still contain some truth. Um, to understand uh, the people that I come from, the Protestant people of Northern Ireland, I do believe you've got to plunge right back to Lundy. Once a year in the centre of Derry, the effigy of Robert Lundy is hung on a scaffold with a sign around his neck that says Lundy the traitor. It's 19 feet tall and it weighs a tonne. There's a parade with bands, many of whose names include the word defenders. Then Lundy is burned and there are cheers and shouts of no surrender. And Lundy, for those of you fortunate enough to not to know, was the governor of the city in 1689 when it was besieged by the Catholic forces of King James. The gates had been shut uh, at the end of 1688 by the apprentice boys who were determined to keep the city a Protestant stronghold. Lundy didn't believe the city could hold out and urged a timely capitulation or negotiation with the Jacobites. The staunch citizens were having none of it. They turned on Lundy who escaped by climbing over the walls and down through the branches of a pear tree. The gates stayed closed. The siege lasted 105 days during which thousands died of disease and hunger and people were reduced to eating dogs, cats and rats fattened on the bodies of the dead but they didn't surrender. As a Protestant in the traditional unionist scheme of things, you're loyal or you're a Lundy. There's no middle way, resist or surrender, and surrender is treachery. Count yourself lucky if there's a pear tree to hand. 
So in my book, Northern Protestants and Unsettled People, I wrote about uh, a number of people who have been considered to be Lundies. And the first of these is um, a painter called Dermot Seymour. I'll just uh, read you a little bit uh, of, from Dermot's interview. Dermot Seymour was born on the Shankill Road to a street fighting, hard drinking father who was rarely around and a mother who committed suicide when he was nine months old. He was reared on a street which no longer exists by his mother's sister and her husband, man, dad, the McKeones. Jimmy McKeown was a shipyard worker who refused to join the Orange Order because he said it wasn't fair. Maud McKeown charred for people in big houses on the Malone Road. And Dermot's uh, paintings, for those of you who know them, and I'm sure certainly uh, Des does, uh, they feature cows, vegetation, Northern Irish graffiti, military installations, human figures, and increasingly some of those human figures uh, were at the time that I wrote Northern Protestants, headless. Who fears to speak of 98, painted in 1988, shows a headless man in a bandsman's uniform, his right hand extended, pressing on the shoulder of a woman also in uniform with a flute in her hand. She's dancing. There's an aggressive feel to the man's stance. In the foreground, an abandoned Ulster flag lies on the ground. Beyond the figure stands a cow, and on the horizon rise the big cranes of Belfast shipyards. The sky is lurid and menacing. Seymour has explained the painting. Being a Protestant for me is like having no head, in the sense that you're not allowed to think. It's hard to hold an individual thought about anything, whether it be in the immediate family or in the community or in the North in general, without becoming a threat or a Lundy. And it could be something as trivial as listening to rock music. Out of that inability to think comes a lot of bizarre, extreme behaviour, like the Shankill butchers. He described the process, your neck being twisted till you've no head. He said the risk for those doing the twisting was, you might talk sense and that threatens their insecurities. And he taught, went on to talk about a world of inferiority complex and uh, the bashing of the confidence of anybody who thought differently. Although there was a small progressive minority within Protestantism, he didn't think that the people could change. Republicanism has stunted them even more than their mechanisms. They've got even more entrenched. There's no such thing as history. Everything is a retaliation for something else. It's a culture based on conflict. It doesn't filter in that the 71% is a majority in a democracy. It doesn't matter what percentage are Protestants. If you want to save the union, you might think of trying to make it more attractive to non-Protestants. And the 71% he's referring to there is, of course, the percentage of people who voted for the Good Friday Agreement. So uh, Dermot is someone that I would see as being a Protestant radical because he has, a, he has an artistic vision which goes beyond what he feels is permitted within the narrow grounds of, of what is regarded as acceptable behaviour or thinking for Protestants. Um, my new book, Northern Protestants on Shifting Ground, is coming out in early May, as, as Hannah mentioned, and it's going to coincide with the centenary of the Northern Irish state. And the cover shows the effigy of Lundy, uh, who remains a potent figure within unionist uh, thinking. The mantra of the DUP is still no surrender. And if you just think back to those interminable years of the Brexit negotiations, Sammy Wilson, who was the party's um, Brexit per, uh, spokesperson, told the British Brexit secretary that he needed to stand up like a man and take a no surrender attitude to the EU. So there was the Lundy who escaped and scarpered back to England and then on to Gibraltar. And there's the Lundy on the cover of my new book. And that's Lundy the traitor who's burned every December in, in Derry. And most of the people who most intimately know what a Lundy is probably know that because they've been accused of being one. The new book is called On Shifting Ground because the poet Jean Blakeney used the term in an interview. She used it to describe her sense that unionism was on such ground and that it needed to steady itself. Personally, I see it a bit differently. I like the term because I see the potential for change within it. However, how that works for the still overwhelmingly unionist Protestant Northern people of Northern Ireland depends on the exercise of imagination and generosity. These are not characteristics I find to be present in political unionism. Without them, I believe the Northern Irish state will end and will end badly. And that's where the Lundies come in. Uh, apart from Dermot, I'd like to talk about Ivan Cooper, who I also interviewed in the original book. 
Um, Ivan Cooper came from just up the road where I, from where I grew up in Drumahoe, just outside of Derry. Um, he lived very close to where the students on the People's Democracy March were attacked by police and local Protestants. And I was only 11 that year, and I remember that sense of fear and weird complicity that I felt in seeing the brothers, the big brothers of boys that I'd been at primary school with, heading up the road with nail studded sticks. Uh, Ivan, of course, was older at that stage and had got involved in um, civil rights movement. And this is a quote from Ivan Cooper, who has sadly died since uh, this interview. October 1968 happened and Craig, which is James Craig, uh, one of the figures in the then unionist government, denounced us as communists and republicans. And overnight I was a traitor and a Lundy. Overnight I was denounced and estranged. His mother's post office was boycotted and petrol bombs were thrown at his house. The unionist establishment had so conditioned people into thinking that this was a republican communist plot, that Ulster was under threat. And in the middle of it all was this young Protestant man and he was a Lundy. They were conditioned into thinking that it wasn't about social issues or the fact that you lived in a dump. All it was was about Ulster and Ulster's future. And of course the Orange Order had attempted to divert Protestants from any sense of solidarity with Catholics by persuading them that their interests were with their own, including landlords and employers. And this of course is one of the well-established tragedies of Northern Ireland. And Ivan Cooper told me that he took great delight in driving through Drumahoe in recent Inmore in his later years in his big red Jaguar past the farms of, of some of the unionists who had um, opposed him. And that kind of revenge might not appeal to Jerry and people before profit, but I can't help admiring it at the same time. Uh, the second person I want to talk about then in, that, in this political regard is Inez McCormack, who also has sadly since died and, and is much missed. And Inez was radicalised by taking part in the Burnt Hollet March, but it started for her much earlier, really. It started for her by not fitting in. She talked about how she didn't fit in in her Protestant primary school and she didn't fit in in her snobbish secondary uh, grammar school. She would later find that same sense when she got involved in the trade union movement, only to find out, out that it had been made for men. No creches, feminist issues dismissed as irrelevant and have persisted with divisive it was male sectionalism, Inez said. So I'm just going to read you a little bit from Inez's, um, Inez's interview as well. Um, and just actually before doing that, I just think in, ter in terms of what she said about trade unionism, I think that's something that a lot of men who consider themselves to be radical today also still need to think about. Uh, when, I, when Inez talked about male sectionalism, I think that sectionalism was present in many self-defined progressive and radical movements in the North. And I do also feel that it still persists. How many men will turn down the chance to speak, a chance to take up a position when they can clearly see that there are no women or almost no women who have been invited? And uh, just pause a moment to allow consciences to be examined in that regard. And uh, then talk a little, read, read you a little bit from, from Inez, which I think offers a challenge to, um, to those who tend to dismiss Protestant radicalism or to define it too narrowly. Inez was one of those appointed to the Human Rights Commission chaired at that stage by Bryce Dixon and set up under the terms of the agreement in 1999. There was an immediate storm of protest from unionists who claimed that nobody from a unionist background had been included. And this is a quote from Inez. I have a track record of bringing both people from both sides together. I would argue that I fought for civil rights and values which are part of the Protestant tradition. Partnership, fairness, mutual respect. These are the values of conscience and therefore Presbyterianism. They are in the agreement and a majority of Protestants voted for them. The challenge is to Protestants who are demoralized to recognize why relationships based on rights should make them feel bad. You don't have a right to a sense of identity which depends on dominating others. Middle class people are going to have to realize that they can't live in a world without worries. The Protestant middle ground will always say there's a hidden agenda. But if you insist that to name an injustice and tackle it is divisive, then you're endorsing that injustice. That's the hard question for Protestants. It isn't about mea culpa. It's about accepting responsibility. If believing in one's conscience in relation to human rights is not Protestant, what is? 
So I think that challenge still still stands and, and is still a really, really interesting one to apply to the present time when some of the things that both Ivan Cooper and Inez were talking about there still very much prevail. So to go back to the figure of Lundy and why I think that figure is so important, um, the image which, which is on the cover of the book is of the effigy of Lundy and uh, the, it's taken from a photograph which was taken by the great um, Trevor McBride, um, who's a Derry photographer who's covered the, the troubles from the very start right through the civil rights movement to the present day. Um, he calls Lundy the Spanish gentleman and um, he's been photographing the, the burning of Lundy for decades now. He admires the artistry that goes into the effigy's creation and uh, contrasts it with the crudity of some of the more recent loyalist mur murals. He loves the elegantly groomed swirl of Lundy's moustache. In 2019, I watched the Spanish gentleman as he swayed on the frame from which he would sh shortly be set ablaze. I was moved by his eloquent coal-rimmed eyes, the white face with rouge cheeks, the lipsticked red lips, the jet black wig against the golden tassels of his tricorn hat and the flourish of his moustache. His glamour was undeniable. Also in 2019, another glamorous figure entered into, the Northern, into Northern Ireland's political discourse. Blue Hydrangea took part in the television series RuPaul's Drag Race UK. She is the creation of Joshua Cargill, who was born in East Belfast in 1996. Blue sashayed on set, wearing a long black wig and a glittering satin and lace dress, with shoulder tassels that were miniatures of the iconic yellow and black Harland and Wolf shipyard cranes. Cargill was shown explaining that, Titana, that the Titanic had been built in the yards where his father and grandfather had worked. His dad had helped him with the costume. Blue spoke of using the platform of the show, which is watched by millions. People look to our country and see repression, she said in an interview. I want to be the opposite of that. But some people are stuck in the past. They still believe you need to be Protestant or Catholic, that you still need to be straight. At Belfast's Pride celebrations that year, Blue prefaced her performance uh, of a lip sync to Lady Gaga's Born This Way with recordings of leading DUP politicians expressing hatred to justify the denial of LGBTQ rights. And it seems to me that, you know, we really do need to look into a, a broader set of definitions of, of what is radical in order to, to move on with the notion of uh, Northern Protestant radical traditions in the present day, because an awful lot of people who are in the Protestant radical tradition don't actually currently define themselves particularly strongly as Protestants and, and some are undoubtedly unionists and, and would defend their uh, position as unionists as being a perfectly um, acceptable radical tradition. Um, you know, I would be thinking there of someone like Sarah Creighton or Julianne Corr Johnson, who recently said in a piece where she's quote, and she's quoted by Sarah Creighton, I'm exhausted with the psychological coercion and perpetual petty cycle of constitutional dominance over socioeconomic change. And I think that there is a hazard that we'll fall into that if we if we keep talking in terms of Protestant traditions, Catholic traditions. Um, some of the people that I've interviewed in my new book uh, include Eileen Weir, who I know was included in a, in a previous uh, session that People Before Profit um, uh, held last week. And she speaks very, very clearly about the need to break down those, those kind of definitions. Sarah Creighton, who I've already mentioned, who talks about being pro-union, but not pro-unionist. And there are quite a number of people in the book like from, from that kind of tradition, uh, one of them being the leading victims campaigner, um, Alan McBride, who talks of being embarrassed by political unionism while he also believes in the union. And these are these are radical people to by any standards, to my mind. Kelly Turtle, uh, who's a person from a very strongly Protestant background who actually would have been a very um, evangelical Protestant herself at one stage in her history, but is now a leading figure within the um, reproductive rights pro-choice movement. Stephen Donan Dalzell, who is a very um, eclectic um, campaigner, a very radical person from a Protestant background, but his primary, uh, her, their primary uh, political identification is in campaigning for human rights and social justice. Sarah Laverty, I've already spoken about. And then I think about 
people like Paul Johnson, who runs the Monkstown Boxing Club, which is referred to in the, um, the article that um, Hannah referred to earlier on that I wrote, which is about, you know, the way that the sectarian orange card is being played again to get another generation of young Protestants out on the streets, failing to see that their interests do not lie in that direction. So I, I just feel that the, the rich tradition um, that has been spoken of is alive and well, but it's alive and well prim primarily among the Lundies and among the very many people who are from a Protestant background, but no one considers to be the primary identification uh, with which they wish in, in, the, in regard to which they wish to be considered as political activists. I think that there is a really strong current tradition of radicalism um, involving all kinds of people of all kinds of ages and backgrounds. And um, we certainly need to move, we need to move on from the old binaries and the old sense of, you know, United Irish men and one man, one vote, and all of those traditions, which somehow or other managed to overlook the fact that some of their key activists were not included in, in those kind of titles. So thank you very much. Wonderful, Susan. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think many of us on the call can identify with how much of what you, uh, with much of what you said in your introduction in terms of both how you identify and how we in the north have attempted to to identify others. So um, so many interesting and important points raised there, and I'm sure it will stimulate lots of questions and comments.